Okay, have fun. I love you. Oh, shut the frick door. <laughs> oh, why am I so nervous to do this? <sighs> Today I'm watching a video that I haven't watched in five years. This is the video that when people put it on and I'm like chilling in the room, I will get up and leave the room unless they turn it off. And it's not that I don't like the past. It's not that I'm embarrassed of the past. It's that the past is like kind of crazy and it feels like another life. And for some reason, like I'm just not a very sentimental person. I'm like the opposite of a hoarder. When someone goes like, oh, look at these sweet memories. I'm like, throw them out, I'm, like get them out of my face. I hate them. So today I'm gonna be very uncomfortable and I'm going to review my draw my life. I did this video when I was a young bright eyed girl living in a big basement and I recorded it in a closet. I think I was pretty sure I was going to school and I was also working at a restaurant called Frankie's. So this is some different times. Look at my face there. Oh my goodness. She wore foundation way too white. All right, here we go. Hello everyone, my name is Kasima. I sound so young. Hello everyone, my name is Kasima. I speak in a much lower octave when I'm comfortable and a much higher octave when I'm nervous. I was very nervous recording Friends, this. teachers, and strangers have always had trouble pronouncing my name, so I just go by Cassie. Now they had trouble pronouncing my name because I lived in a predominantly white town where for some reason, Kasima was the hardest name in the world for them to pronounce. They were like, uh, Kasima, Kasim Charisma. My hungover food teacher was like, Charisma? And everybody laughed at me and I was like, Okay, just call me Cassie, leave me alone. I was born on the 19th on the coldest day of December, as my dad likes to say. I wasn't very good at like reading, enunciating, um, performing back then. This is a young girl trying her best, all right? I'm a middle child. Ugh, middle child. And thankfully, I never felt like the unloved middle child. My parents loved my older brother, my younger sister, and I equally. Oh, I'm giving them some good press. I liked being alone. Still do. I liked being bad. Still do. But you never realize how strange you are until other people make you aware of it. True. When I was very young, I spent a lot of time in Singapore and Malaysia, and one time on the way to Singapore, I climbed the wrong side of an escalator all the way to the top, and I jumped before security could catch me. When I was little, I always wanted to like do stuff to like test the limits of like what I could get away with, even if it was like borderline would kill me. Like I would look down a giant flight of stairs and I'd be like, you know what? Let's go! And I would just like jump down it. Or like I had a pit bull when I was little and I used to like rile him up to the point where he was like, come on, let's go! And then I would just like run away from him as fast as I humanly could and like try to get him to like be a bad dog and basically bite at me just so it like made it more fun to run away. I don't know, I just adrenaline junkie, all right? The trips to Singapore were by far the happiest times of my life. True. Everyone embraced my weirdness and the way of life there is so much different than it is here. I stayed on a little farm in Malaysia for quite some time and the food was so simple, the way of life was so simple and Ooh, I can feel the anxiety. I stayed up all night just watching the fireflies and not being aware of time or take a shot every time I say and and I uh, I watch the fireflies and, and and I mean this is like cute it's endearing like you know it's before I was like super comfortable. I would say it took me about 500 videos to get comfortable on camera. This whole thing didn't come naturally to me. My boyfriend has a Bachelor of Fine Arts and Dramatic Arts and he like really helped me get better on camera because like, yeah, it's just not, it just didn't come naturally to me. When I got back to Lethbridge from Singapore, things changed. School began, the Southside McDonald's now had a play place, and the pace of life got a lot faster. How observant. Every single weeknight, my dad would challenge me with philosophical puzzles. He got me to a math and reading comprehension level far beyond my years. I really did think that I was like, <laughs> so smart. <laughs> And I was like really book smart, but I would say that, and like I'm still really book smart, but I'd say that my street smarts is like, eh, not very good. It's kind of like how my dad is like extremely brilliant man, but like when it comes to working a remote, he's like, help. Help me, please. He made sure I had a knack for learning. He even got me Scrabble instead of Twister for Christmas oh. once. Heartbreaking, but I thank him for it now. Oh, wh why? Why? Because you can spell now? You would have been able to spell anyway. So in the beginning here, I'm saying like, when I was little, I was super happy. I hung out in a jungle with all the little birdies and all the little monkeys. And then I came back to my hometown and like just the pace of life was really fast and I didn't know how to keep up with it. And like the culture shock was kind of intense. But my dad kept me distracted by going, uh, here, read this, do this. You want Twister? Scrabble. One day on the school bus, a boy poked his head out from the seat in front of me, stretched his eyes across his face and said, you're 
my knees. I was new to racist tomfoolery, so I was silent and very confused. He got all of his friends to make the same face. It's amazing the things you vividly remember forever. So true. I'm a quarter Chinese, but my physical attributes don't make it very evident. I was one of the few exotic kids around, so students always mixed up my ethnicity interchangeably. This actually kind of reminds me, like, yeah, the are you Chinese thing happened, which was interesting. When I was in the sixth grade, all the boys were like, Taylor's gonna ask you out, Taylor's gonna ask you out, and I was like, oh my gosh, he is? Ooh, okay. And um, what actually happened is some guy walked up to me with like a picture of a man in a turban, and he was like, he shows me this picture, and he's like, your husband is waiting. And everybody burst out laughing, and I was like, What's the joke? I think I'm missing the joke, but apparently it was like really funny because like I'm not white and the guy in the turban looks like he isn't white. Haha, <laughs> good one. Not too long after, my sister came home crying. She wasn't a crier, so I was super alarmed about it. No, she was not. I asked her what happened and she said that she wasn't allowed in her friend's hot tub because her friend's mother thought my sister's skin was made of dirt. Ah! Ugh, it makes me so mad to hear about it still. <sighs> As if she thought that her rusty little kid was cleaner than us because her rusty little kid had less melanin in her skin, like, okay. I wish I was kidding. We were shaken and resolved to spend more time together. From paper dolls to church youth group to video games, some of the best times I had were with my sister. We loved writing and filming plays and doing anything creative. My sister knew how to crack me up. One time while playing GoldenEye, she actually made me laugh so hard I peed my pants. Oh man, I, I had to include that. <laughs> She literally made everyone laugh so hard. Like she just, she was so smart. You know how I was saying like, I'm book smart, but I'm not street smart. She was like the perfect, most brilliant combination of both. And she could hang with any crowd and make anybody laugh. And it was interesting. Cause like, I always had a really hard time making friends and she always would like show up and then come home with like eight friends and I never really understood it. The racist generalizing and stigma made me grow to really hate the way I looked. I was always covering my face with my coat sleeve. So true. Like this is how I would like chill in school. I'd be like, hey guys. For some reason I was like, I felt safer when I was like walking around like this or when I took my, my dirty blue Nike or Roxy sleeve and just like put it over my whole face. Like I, I could, I'd put it over my whole face if I could, but like then I wouldn't be able to see. I started combating bullying with bullying and my aggression got me out of a lot of potentially humiliating situations. So being very angry, jealous, and bitter was a tool I kept all the way until the end of high school. So this is very, very honest actually. And you know, a lot of people always like try to make themselves look like the victim and say like, oh, I, like feel sorry for me. Like bad things have happened to me and I've never done anything bad in return, but I'm openly saying here, yeah, <laughs> I got bullied really bad, so I became really mean too. I wasn't mean because I was a mean person. I was mean because I was scared and it felt like the only way to just get people off of me. You know what I mean? My aggression was based on fear. The people who bully you are doing so because they have deep-seated issues. Me. Something deep and dark is blocking their empathy. So please don't take it seriously, or at least try not to. It's not you, it's them. I do wish that I was the kind of person who like just turned the other cheek and I guess was like a good example, but my story, me personally, no, <laughs> I was not. I was pretty rambunctious, pretty rude, pretty awful, pretty conniving, pretty manipulative, just like all these little things that didn't exist when I was a child became more and more apparent as I grew up because I needed these things. I felt like I needed these things to like get by. And I wish that I was, you know, a bigger person when I was little, but unfortunately that's not how it went. Middle school was difficult. I had one true friend, Ashley, who is still my best friend. <laughs> Ash. We'd hide together in boot rooms and bathroom stalls during lunch period every single day. We would hide in the bathroom because we didn't want to get bullied and like the popular girls noticed that we were hiding in the bathroom so they would like tell admin, they would tell the principal and like teachers and stuff. They'd be like, these two gross girls are hiding in the bathroom. So the teachers would come, drag us out of the bathroom so that those girls could bully us again. It was a very uh, good, it was an effective system they had going on. Near the end of middle school, Ashley switched schools due to bullying and my family encountered problems that caused even more anxiety for me. People had all sorts of theories about my life that were very painful for me to listen to. Honestly, and people still talk. People talk, man. Like sometimes I'll hear stuff about me and I'll be like, huh? <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> Like, just ask me. One of the reasons why I haven't like said goodbye on this channel, Cloudy Apples, is because I feel like I might wanna like have a time where I come back. I feel like people don't really care. And that's why I don't really tell people who don't know me personally how I'm feeling, unless it's like 
relevant. I didn't open up to anyone because I didn't want anyone to feel sorry for me. I still don't. People with too much time on their hands will always have theories and unsubstantiated opinions. Don't listen to them. There are so many beautiful things in this world to fill your head with. Amen. Just remember that anyone can say anything. Be equally critical of all statements. Ooh, a little skeptic. Predictably, high school was a nightmare. I skipped more classes than I showed up to in my final two years, and I didn't take care of myself. I was troubled inside, and my sister had similar feelings. But she had a lot of friends and was always putting on a happy front. I later learned that we both have something called clinical depression. Yeah, we do. It's not seasonal or circumstantial, it's kind of always there, and environmental factors can intensify it. You can't completely cure it, it's something I've had to manage and be aware of. After taking a semester off, I went to college with my brother. It was the only school that would let me in with my high school <laughs> grades, and we took the same classes, talked about books all day, and wore the same shoes like the weirdos we are. Why do I keep saying I'm a weirdo? I feel like bullying is like always gonna exist. Hopefully it doesn't someday, but I feel like these days you're a little bit more free to express who you are. And back then, if you so much as wore like a yellow hoodie to school, and like most people didn't wear yellow, people would be like, you're weird. Or if you were like quirky and funny, or like if you were different in any way, people would call you weird. And like I can see like, I guess like the shell shock from that in my voice and the way that I describe things, the way that I'm articulating things. It's just like, oh, we're, we're weird, we're weird, don't worry, we're weird. I'm like trying to make people think that, you know, I'm weird, but like, Hope that's okay. We both got straight A's, scholarships, and invites to a university. We killed. Within a few months of my first semester at university, my unhealthy, sedentary lifestyle resulted in health issues that made me constantly ill, fatigued, and insecure. Freshman 15? You know, the freshman 15, like where you're first in school and like you gain a lot of weight because all you're doing is sitting around drinking coffee, eating, and studying all day? My freshman 15 was way worse than that. And like mentally, whoo! I attempted to combat my depression with SSRIs or antidepressants, which in my case, Case, made me irritable, spontaneous, and suicidal. Ooh, it was a mess. I had severe emotional difficulty and withdrew from university under extenuating circumstances. I attempted a myriad of quick fixes and diets only to worsen my problems. I was emotionally turbulent, my acne was bad. <laughs> I'm so honest about how horrible I was. <laughs> like, just literally just like angry all the time. And I'm trying to like fix that anger. I, I feel like I've certainly like gotten a lot better at it. And like my growing empathy as I get older has helped me a lot with that. But like back then, like if I was, if I would just go off. I had chronic migraines and I was 30 pounds heavier. Now 30 pounds, it doesn't sound like a lot. I'm very short, I'm very small. So like on my frame, like that's actually, I didn't look the same and I didn't feel the same. And it just wasn't what my body wanted for me. The conventional fixes failed me miserably. And more importantly, I couldn't let my depression grow any more intense. Responsible. I had nothing to lose, so I took a personal risk. I abandoned my emotional and dietary habits and threw my various medications in the garbage. I developed a healthy skepticism and started doing my own research. Okay, now this is something that worked for me. I feel quite irresponsible that I said that like, this is what I did and it worked and then yeah! Cause you know, like it might not work for everybody. And like, what if somebody who actually needed their medication was watching this and was like, oh, I'm gonna throw mine out too. Like it's like, this is part of the reason why I have trouble posting on Cloudy Apples. Cause like, I don't want to lead somebody astray. You know what I mean? Back when I was younger, I didn't think so hard about these things. And that's why it's easier for me to just like try to entertain you and have fun with you and connect with you. Giving advice like this and like seeing myself give advice like this, like it gives me the worst anxiety. You can't help someone who doesn't want help. And despite the efforts of my loving friends and family, I didn't get better until I made it a personal mm -hmm. priority. A year later, my sister got hit by an aggressive, unapologetic drunk driver. She was left with severe emotional damage and permanent tissue damage in her neck and back. Despite her personal pain, she was always smiling and being a complete goof like usual. So when my sister got in that car crash, this drunk driver just like hits her and she had like a really sore neck for a really long time and it was like kind of messed up. Like her neck hurt really bad and she was in pain all the time. But at work, if you work at some of the restaurants in Vancouver, they force you if you're a girl to wear heels. So my sister was like wearing heels, chilling at work one day and an insurance person who was hired to spy on my sister because they didn't want to pay, looked at her and said, oh, she's wearing high heels to work you're not covered and like we didn't have the money back then to like pay for all of the therapy and stuff there's a lot of stuff that's like really money grubbing out there and there's a lot of stuff that like makes me very cynical that like I have to work on because like that situation made me really mad she trusted in her healthcare practitioner and moved forward a few months after I returned to university, my sister overdosed on antidepressants. The medication caused her to have seizures, but she was safe. When she woke up, I told her it was the worst day of my life. 
She smiled at the sight of us and started acting like her old self. She was kept in a psychiatric ward for two weeks, and when she was finally released, she came home and built her life again. She got a job, a car, made great new friends, and was constantly smiling. I left school a second time to be with her, and she was constantly surrounded by people who loved her unconditionally. You'd never know by looking at her that she was depressed. She was beautiful, and she knew how to project an image of confidence. She did what she wanted, and I couldn't even tell her what to do. I was always worried about her. Since I was spending so much time at home, I started YouTubing. My depression was completely under control, I had a new perspective and felt amazing, which made me so excited to share. I had been on YouTube before, but it was a fun and shallow channel, which is perfectly fine, but I lost interest. I pestered my sister endlessly about what I had learned, but aside from a few things that she liked and shared, she was often busy with life and disinterested. I remembered that no one was capable of helping me until I made it a priority to help myself. After much pleading, I figured that I didn't want to be one of those people who pushes their beliefs on others who didn't ask. I'm still one of those people. I met an amazing guy named Terry, a friend of my older brother. My sister and I loved his knack for comedy. Oh, my sister used to bully Terry so bad. It was the funniest thing. Like, I loved it so much. Like, I loved me and my sister together because we were just like, we were just bad. We were baddies. <laughs> Something you guys need to understand about clinical depression is that things like possessions, looks, success, and even love can stand in your way of happiness. Pay attention. It's a feeling that's inaccessible to many, and it's fruitless to pretend you know how it feels if you haven't felt it. It's incredibly hard to describe, which creates an even more intense feeling of isolation. This past summer, at 2 a.m., I got a phone call from my brother. His voice sounded cold and shaken. Ugh, I'll never forget that phone call. He told me to wake up my dad. We all woke up and went to the living room, and that's where my brother told us that my sister had taken her own life. Upon hearing the news, I didn't know if I'd ever be happy again. We were inseparable for most of our lives, and nobody understood me like she did. It has caused me great emotional and existential stress. I miss her so much. Some days after hearing the news, I reflected on what I taught myself and figured I had to spread some love and positivity, otherwise the gravity of the situation would be too much. After my sister passed away, like, I didn't cry about it for like a year. Because, you know, everybody else was crying and I was like, what can I do, like, to help? And it's just so typical of me that I would go and I would be like, what positive things can I do? Because like, everyone was so upset and I was like, dad, what can I do? I'll plan the funeral, I'll pay for it. Even though I didn't have any money at the time. So I like did all that and then I did everything with the death certificate and then like I made it sure everything was okay and I made sure that I was the strong one. Because like, imagine if we were all a mess, then it would have just been like a mess. So I did all that and like in this like, in this numb kick, of trying to make everything better. I was like, I need to make like art too. Like I need to make like some positive art. And so I made this video. So I wrote and filmed a video called Happiness Takes Effort. It was about how important your perspective is and like just like the power of the mind. It was about like a bus driver who I saw who worked a very mundane job and he seemed to be very happy. He was like, hey, how's it going? Woo! And I was like, yeah, let's go. And like his energy, like it reciprocated. It, it was a really beautiful thing. So I was like, I want to make a video about that bus driver. Definitely YouTube has changed, <laughs> but that's where I was at at the time. And that's what I wanted to do. If it weren't for all the resilience I taught myself, I wouldn't have made it through this hard time. I used to be so fragile and guarded, but I've learned that if you don't live life honestly, things fall apart slowly. Oh, so true. One of like the easiest ways, or not easy, <laughs> wasn't easy at all. I'm just not very articulate right now because like my brain's gonna explode. One of the ways that I really climbed myself out of my depression is like I was saying before, like I was very hateful, mean, manipulative. I need to start taking hits in order to be honest. Like I, I need to tell the truth even if it really hurts at first. And so like I started doing that little by little to the point where I'm at a place now where when I lie, I have really bad anxiety. And I had to lie about something the other night. I didn't have to, it was a choice, which I take responsibility for. I lied to a friend about something the other night and like I freaked out. I told Terry, I told all of my friends, I told my whole family. <laughs> I told the psychiatrist, I was like, ah, why did I do this? But like, I figured out how I will never do that again, which is nice. I feel like the girl who made this video was a really, really strong person who is putting up a strong front, but still looking for answers. And if you were to ask me now how I feel about the whole thing, about my sister dying, to be blunt, um, it sucks. It sucks really bad. And it's the kind of thing that you can say that it gets better with time, but it only gets better with time in the sense that 
You can get distracted more easily the more time has passed. But every time you think about it, it's that gut-wrenching, empty, horrible, what am I doing here feeling. And there's nothing I can do about it. And I have to live with it for the rest of my life. So many people reached out and told me that she saved them from hurting themselves. Oh, she did. One of my closest friends owes his life to my sister. She helped so many people out of their dark vices, but she never prioritized herself. She took time with others and threw quick fixes at herself. When I see her smile in photos now, I'm reminded of the fronts that she put on to stop people from worrying about her. Ugh, that's why I don't like the past and I don't like pictures. I have so many regrets, man. Like, I, I, like there's so many things that I wish I could do. And I know that everyone always says like, don't blame yourself, like it's not your fault. Like ultimately it's that person's decision, but like that doesn't help. The only way that this situation has helped me, and I've had people say like, oh, well, you're stronger now. Look at you now. And it's like, well, I would trade all of it to get her back. She once told me that good people do not take popular belief in mob mentality as truth. She was definitely the person who made me hate mob mentality. Good people have the responsibility to be themselves despite the consequences. I got hundreds of emails, messages, and phone calls from friends, family, peers, and attention seekers who pretended they were good friends with my sister. Ugh. So after my sister passed away, you know, like Facebook, right? There were all these people who weren't her friend, who were pretending that they were friends with her. There were people who were like, did you guys hear the news? On my sister's wall. Oh, there were people who commented online saying, she probably deserved it. It was probably her family's fault. She probably was a gold digger. She probably was this. She probably was that. And they're just saying these things because she was a beautiful girl. Like, I- Because they don't know her. All they know is what she looks like. And that's one of the things, like, I, I've been working so hard to, like, love people and be positive, but all you get instead is gloom. <laughs> and she tries her best. But sometimes people can just be awful. The virtual world of the internet bombarded me all at once, demanding answers and acknowledgement. They unknowingly put me under an immense amount of stress. The positive after everything that happened is that I definitely learned who my good friends are, who my real friends are. There were a lot of people who like vanished right after it happened and there were a lot of people who were there with me every day. My house became like the place where everyone came and everyone mourned for like two weeks straight. And um, again, like I, I couldn't really show my emotions at the time. And even to this day, like I have a really hard time showing emotions. I have a really hard time being vulnerable because there's so much guilt involved with uh, putting that on other people because I've felt to the highest degree what that did to me. So that sucks. I mean, I feel like I'm a lot more open with like therapists and like psychiatrists and like people who are like hired to listen. It's a lot harder for me to be open with people who depend on me, and that's like everyone, so. My heart is heavy, but love and positivity push me forward. In my darkest moment, my true friends came together and made me laugh, cry, and feel truly grateful. Once I felt the deepest sorrow, seeing beauty in the mundane revealed my immense capacity for joy. Glad I had Terry. <clears throat> I'm not perfect, but I fight fear every day with positivity. I know who I am because it wasn't easy to get here. My sister wasn't perfect either, but she loved deeply and she was brilliant. She could make anyone smile on the worst day of their life. She could make me laugh if I was heartbroken. We both loved art created by people with pained hearts because for us, it was proof that we weren't alone. I feel like this video is a good message. I've noticed like a creator who I won't say his name, he like made this horrible video and used it as an example to bring awareness to something. But his awareness was just like, you know, like just, you're not alone. <laughs> it just felt so trite. It, it felt like it came from somebody who has never been through anything in his life. But maybe that's just me. And maybe it did help somebody. So that would be my argument for him being able to exist and being able to make that kind of stuff. For me though, when I saw that, I was like, oh, I didn't get like offended to the point where I was like, ah, take that down. Even with like jokes, I don't get offended. Like you would think that if people made certain jokes about like sensitive topics that I'd get really offended and like sad and oh my God, how I'm so triggered. But like, that's just not who I am. It's a lot easier for me to laugh in a horrible situation than it is for me to cry. So like laughing is a really good outlet for me. And that's why I think that like comedy should just be what it is and we shouldn't try to censor it. She had so much to offer and she used all of her energy to help her friends, but she left her own well-being in the dark. She hated to see us worry, so she put on a front and I'm guilty of doing the same thing. I still am. But if you want to do continuous good, you have to prioritize your own well-being first. Being completely selfless is not sustainable. 
and no one can help you until you're willing to help yourself. That's dank advice. Honesty hurts, but it can save your life. So don't be afraid, and if people have negative things to say about your outlook, be grateful that your empathy, compassion, and access to critical thinking is not so limited that you would act like a child and shamelessly hurt others. In light of the madness, it can be hard to see the positive, but I believe you can find light in some of the darkest situations. <laughs> I know life is not easy or fair. I'm not entitled to anything, and I have to fight for my happiness. Have to fight for everything. If you're hurting right now, please fight it and don't give up on yourself. If I were there with you, I'd lend an ear, make you food, and try to make you laugh. But for now, build your strength so you can endure anything, distinguish yourself, and embrace your weirdness. That's so cute. I used to say love and light at the end of a lot of stuff, because I thought that was so cute. Look how little I look, like a little baby. <laughs> She's a cute one. It's a hard thing to watch because, again, it just, like, rehashes stuff. And even though, um, like, various jokes and stuff, like, don't trigger me, things that actually are deep enough to put me in that headspace do. As far as, like, keeping my head up and keeping things going. I mean, a lot of good things have come from it. I've had a lot of really good experiences. I've had a really good life. I still do like feel this big gaping empty because of what happened, but it is a nice motivation in a way to keep going and to try to help other people out of that or try to make them laugh. For me, laughter is the most important thing. It's more important than people virtue signaling or saying like, or, or making like a ton of videos about mental health during my darkest times stuff that made me laugh just mindless brainless stuff that made me laugh is the stuff that made me feel a lot better obviously i have a chemical imbalance in my brain and obviously my brain goes there sometimes it goes to like really dark places but because of what i've been through at this point i can almost certainly say you don't ever have to worry about me ever doing something crazy to myself because I've seen what that can do to others. So if you ever go to a dark place, think about everybody who loves you. Think about everyone you're gonna leave behind. Think about how their lives will change forever and um, just keep trucking on. Throughout this video, you've probably noticed some very stark differences between the cloudy apples in this video, in the Draw My Life, and the gloom now. And um, I will say that one of the reasons why cloudy apples drove me so insane uh, and I, I was so unhappy <laughs> is because I was constantly trying to be perfect all the time. I was constantly trying to be a beam of light all the time that to brighten your day and to just be perfect and to have to, the perfect advice and to always know what to say. And Gloom is kind of me rejecting that. I could have called my channel like Princess Peach or something. <laughs> but like in retrospect, I wanted to name it Gloom because I felt like I was super stressed because I was always trying to be perfect and happy all the time and I just wanted to be myself and have fun and learn how to have fun and be myself on the internet. Even though Cloudy Apples, it, it was me. I was being myself, but I was trying to be the perfect role model all the time. You can imagine what that does to somebody like internally. And I like Gloom because I feel comfortable in being myself. I feel comfortable in that you guys like me for that. And I feel like if Gloom didn't work out, then I would have quit YouTube because I just wanted to be able to be myself. And if the market rejected that, then I would have had no business here. So thank you for watching my channel. Thank you for supporting me. Thank you for everything, really. It's cool to be able to watch this with you, even though it's from 2013. Whew, that was a long time ago. I hope you guys enjoyed this video and I will see you on the next one.